Hi friends, welcome to the Anomnon Conference. I'm sure Ryan's already welcomed you, but first off, I just want to thank Ryan Sprague. Thank you so much for letting me do this. I'm truly honored to be part of this wonderful conference with amazing speakers. It's a little bit intimidating, but uh, I'm going to do my best. So here we go, folks. Okay, my lecture is going to be about the weird stuff, the role of absurdity and surrealism in high strange encounters. Okay. Slide change. I'm going to be a little slow on those. But uh, so the universe is not made of atoms. It's made of stories. I love this quote. I heard it years ago. And for me, it really resonated. And obviously, there's no scientific, you know, validity to it, perhaps. But for me, it's kind of my uh, my personal truth, if you will. Da -da -da, change the slide. Okay, so I love this Camus quote, because it's really absurd in itself. And it's like, it's a puzzle. And every time I see this quote, it means something different to me. I'm not sure if it will have that effect for you. But anyway, folks, UFOs, the paranormal, the unexplained, we love them, right? That's why we're here. And, you know, they're really having a moment from media hungry fans of ghost and Bigfoot content to congressional hearings teasing UFO disclosure. These topics that we know and love have been yanked out of the realm of marginalia and are now becoming a hit hit TV series and are trending topics on social media for better or for worse. Um, so, and while the growth and popularity of UFOs and the paranormal is probably a positive thing, I feel that sometimes the most important aspects are being left out of the mainstream study of these topics. And that is that UFOs, the paranormal, supernatural, cryptozoology is weird. It's really weird. It's absurd. It's surreal, and oftentimes, as long as no one was hurt or too terribly traumatized, it's even kind of funny. And perhaps these feelings are key elements of the impact that whatever this intelligence is, or maybe not, it may not even be an intelligence, is trying to make. And while I feel I very do much believe that science has a major role to play in this stuff, I feel that philosophers, theologians, artists, and even humorists have a major role to play as well and garnering a greater understanding of whatever this phenomenon is. Slide change a ruski. All right. So, Twin Peaks, man. For me, it's the greatest media representation of the absurd, the weird aspects of UFOs and the supernatural. Twin Peaks, it has this dreamy feeling of the Black Lodge, the offbeat use of comedy in the visually surreal images that make me feel like I'm actually having a high strange experience. I remember when I watched it when I was 12 years old, with my mother, the pilot, I truly felt like I was being initiated into the world of the weird. I also believe that there is an inherent anti-structure self negating component to these supernatural experiences people have. And absurdity is often the vehicle for how it's conveyed. It can distort a reality in a whimsical fashion and can even greatly impact the experiencer's worldview. And maybe because absurdity stands out, it makes an impact, it helps you remember, and it can be used to make a moment having an unrealness about it. I'm pretty sure I just made up the word unrealness, but let's get into the lexicon because it makes sense, right? It's something out of the ordinary absurdity. And that is a detail that I personally focus on when I'm reading, researching UFOs and the paranormal. Perhaps it's the phenomenon's way of shouting at the experiencer, hey, you, this is not normal. Pay attention. Da -da 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 -da. Gotta change the slide. Gotta do the slide thing. I'm slow on that. So here we go. Um, okay. So surrealism. Surrealism, in my opinion, is the artsy cousin of absurdity. Surrealism is a 20th century avant-garde movement in art and literature which sought to release the creative potential of the unconscious mind. For example, by the irrational juxtaposition of images. It's a style, in my silly opinion, that surrealism in art is a vehicle to transport visions from the other world, the astral plane, whatever you want to call it, to the screen, to the canvas, or on vinyl. And I like to think, for example, the extremely wide array of UFO occupants, their behaviors, their deceptive qualities are a perfect example of surreal images, perhaps borrowed from our unconscious mind. In comedy, surrealism is often used as non sequiturs, offbeat details or references. 
In film, it's used as a tool of dream logic, such as a David Lynch movie, Re really any David Lynch movie. In a Lynch film, a common motif is that on the exterior of a location or even within a person, things maybe seem normal, mundane, like a slice of cherry pie at the local diner. But underneath or inside, there is a whole world of abstract weirdness transpiring. And it's that world underneath and inside that I'd like to bend your ear about today. The Black Lodge, where the supernatural entities of Twin Peaks reside, is a wonderful, to me, media representation of the other world, the astral plane, and maybe an artistic metaphor for where UFOs, cryptids, ghosts, synchronicities, you name it, all come from. Changing the slide, ch ch changing the slide. Ooh, pretty books. So, John Keel lovingly referred to it as the Super Spectrum, and Jacques Vallée in his groundbreaking book, Passport to Magonia, referred to it as, you guessed it, Magonia. Da, 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 do, 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 Changing the slide, sorry. That's my changing the slide little music I'm going to use. Uh, so, many see UFOs simply as one sees a Norman Rockwell painting. You know, everything's kind of on the surface. There's not a lot of hidden depth in my opinion, to that kind of work. And I'm not saying that's good or bad, but sometimes I do feel like it's forgotten that a good number of experiencers describe their experiences in the art language of a Salvador Dali painting. Some of these cases I'll be using as an example will maybe seem kind of goofy to people who really are hardcore firmly planted in the nuts and bolts camp, which, look, it's fair. I can't prove the validity of any of these cases. That's not my point today. However, I do think it's important to remember that sometimes these big organizations that have been collecting data on Bigfoot, UFOs, and reports, they often leave out the weird stuff. And the reason is likely because they won't be taken seriously by the scientific community. Who cares? But to leave out the weird, honestly, I think is bad science. It does not further us down the road of understanding the origin or the meaning of the subject. Sure, the weirdest probably doesn't give you a better grasp on propulsion and all that stuff I'll never understand or even really care about, to be honest. But the weirdness and the sheer variety of encounter experiences tend to do away with the simple narrative structures of a galactic federation or the simplicity of a nuts and bolts explanation. So, blah, 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 Steve. With all that being said, I'm going to give you some examples of encounter cases that are so deeply burned into my psyche and they've had a real impact in like a being a lover of stories and a lover of philosophy. These different encounters I'm going to talk about really are absurd. They're surreal. And I think they're sort of funny, aside from any kind of trauma anyone experienced, obviously. So there's two kind of modes of emotional experience that I'd like to kind of have everyone keep in mind as I go through some of these examples. One is dream logic, all right? So dream logic, which is defined as the nonsensical logic one possesses while dreaming that makes perfect sense until he or she wakes up. To me, a lot of the cases that I'm going to be talking about, or cases in general that are thought of as weird, strange, operate in a kind of dream logic. Two, changing the slide, ch -ch -ch changing the slide, okay. Uh, two is Jenny Randall's Oz Factor. And this is a wonderful term she coined where it refers to an experience being isolated or transported by the real world of everyday life into an environmental framework, which is quite similar to the real world, but changed enough to be noticeable and disturbing. And some of the even like detailed elements of that are when they step into this almost bubble of non-reality, the sound, everything sound different. The atmosphere feels weird. There's just a feeling of being transported into another reality when people have these high strange experiences often. Do, 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 do. Okay. And then some of the, um, these are some of the attributes too, that I'm, I feel all these cases kind of represent that I'm going to be talking about. One is a performative quality. A lot of times these encounters feel like almost like little staged plays to me. Uh, pop culture mimicry. It does seem that when you kind of go back and, study a certain decade of ufology or you know cryptozoology maybe not so much cryptozoology but it seems like whatever the phenomenon is it's kind of mimicking our pop culture uh there is such a wide array wide array of manifestations i mean if these are aliens from another planet we must have like 1500 different aliens from different planets coming here uh paralysis 
Paranormal residue. Oftentimes when people have these experiences, later they go home thinking like, wow, that was crazy. But then poltergeist activity starts happening and they'll having psychic premonitions, just weird stuff tends to follow them home. Sometimes. Uh, changes in perception prior to the encounters. A lot of times right before encounter happens, people do kind of experience that Oz factor. Uh, time being played out in a nonlinear fashion. Oftentimes the linear world that we live in is just thrown into a tizzy during these experiences. Uh, stage displays for witnesses. That kind of goes with the performative quality at the top. Time distortions. Time gets all WYSIWYG. Uh, reality transformations. Uh, nonsensical qualities. Unusual sounds and older odors like sulfur, burning rubber, and even like whirring noises that are often heard before people have a UFO encounter. Uh, and then encounters not appearing what they... Encounters not being what they appear to be. I will go into that further, obviously. So, with my first case, I am going to be talking about Jerry Townsend's Tin Cans. So, in 1965, Jerry Townsend was driving uh, right outside of Long Prairie, Minnesota, when his car stopped, which we've heard that before. And so, as he was coasting around a bend in the road, he came to a stop and he sees a giant rocket ship. And it's, I mean, it's 30 to 40 feet tall. And so he like stares at it for a little bit and then he sees a bright colorless light appear at the bottom of the rocket ship and three beer can looking alien entities, whatever you want to call them, are staring back at him. He kind of thinks to himself for a minute, like, hey, I'm going to go over there and push one of those, grab one of those tin cans so, you know, I can have some proof of this thing. He even thought about pushing over the rocket. So he gets out of his car and he's staring one down. He's kind of having a standoff with these uh, beer can aliens. And then one of them kind of rushes at him, like at, in a kind of aggressive fashion. He smartly gets back in his car to safety. And then the tin cans kind of like look at him. They go back under the light. The light becomes bright. The rocket takes off and it goes up into the air. And then it comes to a complete standstill. A rocket right to a standstill. Then it vanishes. So right away, he goes and reports this to the police. The police come out and investigate uh, the situation. They find three little oil slicks, and they do find out later that um, multiple people saw lights right around the same time in the same area. I think a group of hunters saw them and some other people. But this case is obviously very odd. I love it. It's got all the hallmarks of absurdity. Beautiful. A+. plus. Um, the next case I want to talk about is, uh, look, I'm, I'm originally from Nebraska, so I have to put a Nebraska case in there. Uh, it's, I call this one the winged weirdy. And so in Falls City, Nebraska, 1956, a man that had the alias, Mr. Hanks, he didn't want to give out his name for obvious reasons. Uh, he was driving home from work right into Falls City, Nebraska, and I've been to Falls City. It is a tiny little town. So he was, I know the exact road he was probably driving in because there's one way in, one way out. And he is, you know, getting back into town, gets back into town a little bit close to his neighborhood, and he sees something flying in the sky that looks like a giant bird. And he's like, oh, it must be a hawk or something. And then it starts getting kind of closer, and it looks like it's wobbling and kind of having problems flying. Uh, and so he's like, well, that is very odd. And he sees the thing. It gets closer, and see, he's starting to notice some details of it, that this is a creature or entity that's got really wrinkled brown tan leathery skin piercing ice water blue eyes and it has a computer type device on its chest and it's turning dials and knobs and it's got these wings obviously that's how it's flying but they're not organic wings like kind of you would think of as a mothman or a lot of other flying humanoid cases these are there's a shoulder harness strap like it's wearing an apparatus which you can almost think of, is that the UFO? <laughs> you know, like the actual wings and the computer thing. But he, he described it as demonic looking. And it seemed to be having some kind of mechanical problems. So when it got closer to him, he got out of his car and he was immediately paralyzed. Just, you know, utter fear coursing through his blood. And it gets close, it's wobbling. And then after a while, it kind of, by turning some knob, course corrects itself and flies off. Now, the thing was, he, this really had a major impact on poor Mr. Hanks. He was quoted in saying that for the rest of his life, 
he actually took on other jobs so he didn't have to sleep as much because he would always have nightmares. It disrupted his family life like you hear about a lot of times. So this isn't really one of the funny cases, but uh, he really had some psychological problems after this. And he, <laughs> the thing that like such bad psychological problems that he needed to work more. He needed to get another job because he just had to keep his mind off this thing. Poor guy. Awful situation. Uh-oh. Okay, and so the next case I'm going to be kind of going over is the Cusack UFO Devils. So in August 29th, 1967, a 13-year-old boy and a nine-year-old, his nine-year-old sister were, you know, walking around the beautiful countryside in France, and they noticed this ball in, like, in a clearing. And, you know, then they kind of, you know, walk a little closer to see what was going on, and they see... Four little entities covered in like a black skin tight suit. And then they had like little pointy beards, pointy nose, and they looked like little devils, they said. Uh, one was holding a mirror like object. There was a very strong smell of sulfur in the air. Uh, Josh Cutchin, anybody? Uh, the Rimstone Deceit? Uh, read more about that if you want to know more about sulfur. Um, so they stared at this, you know, totally confused. And after a while, the beings started floating up in the air and one by one would go head first into this like spherical orb thing, except for the last one was looking around the ground and he, he picked up his mirror. Thing. Oh, also, they were rooting around the soil when they first caught him. Right? I forgot to mention that. But the last one was like looking for his little mirror object, grabbed it, and then he hopped in it too. So the two kids, I believe um, their father was the mayor. And so he, like, you know, immediately got some police out there. They went and investigated. They did find some yellow trace evidence of yellowed grass, and there was still a very strong smell of sulfur. And also, what's up with the soil samples? How much dirt do we really need? Gosh. Uh, here's just a kind of a, a different illustration of the beings going beep, head first into the orb, which I think is so adorable and so funny. Um, okay. Uh, so this next one, some of you have probably heard this one, maybe not. Um, but I love this case. I was actually trying to find this location this summer. My wife is kind of from the area. So I had my father-in-law drive me around the area by the police, old police barracks. So I kind of got a sense of where it could be. It was like one of three properties and it was still just so wonderful. I love the magic of place and seeing where things might've happened. It's exciting for me. Anyway. On October 25th, 1973, Uniontown, Pennsylvania, 15 witnesses saw a red object. One boy and his friend grabbed a gun to go get a closer look of where the object appeared to have landed in like a in a, fairing, in a, in a clearing. He noticed that it was actually headed to, towards his father's house. So he has a gun and some tracer bullets and real bullets, and they go over and they see this red disc hovering by a barn, just right off the ground. Sorry, I need a little drink. Oh, that's so good. It's so good. So they're staring at this object and they smell a putrid smell in the air. There's a whirring noise. And then all of a sudden they hear what sounds like very loud babies crying. Terrifying. And they are like, what in the hell is going on here? And they notice that on the fence line, like where here's the barn, here's the UFO. And there's a fence coming up. They notice two very tall, Bigfoot-like creatures with glowing green eyes. So one of the boys, I, I don't know if I would do this, takes one of the tracer rifle, fires two. On the second one, one of the creatures tries to reach out and grab the bullet, the tracer bullet, as it's flying towards them. And all of a sudden, the UFO completely vanishes. Uh, later, the you know, and so the two creatures are still by the fence line. And eventually, they kind of turned around and started walking back into the tree-lined forest area where they came from. The police came later and investigated the scene, and the first officer who came said where the UFO had supposedly landed, there was a giant red glow that he said, I could read a newspaper from the glow on the ground. Then later, the wonderful Stan Gordon, the infamous Stan Gordon, he has kind of been the guy who has reported all the stuff in Pennsylvania in terms of like high strangers, Bigfoot, UFOs, him and his team came out like at two in the morning to investigate the case. The, the glow was gone by then, but there was this putrid, awful, you know, rotten egg smell 
that hung in the area, making some of his investigative team actually like sick and vomiting. Then the boy who had shot at the Sasquatch, uh, he, his name is not available. He started going into convulsions, started acting animalistic, was like growling. They, they said it sounded like something that would not come from a human, but he was growling and he was going absolutely ballistic. So l- later on, you know, th- they kind of calm him down, get him kind of, you know, back to normal. He all of a sudden after the after this thing happened, he wore glasses his whole life. He didn't need glasses anymore. He for the years and years afterwards, he had psychic visions, premonitions. He claimed that like he would like say to a bird, like come land on my shoulder, the bird would land on his shoulder. So there was all this after effects that are really interesting to think about too. And you hear about this sometimes with these high strange encounters. And I just love the idea. And this is not the only case in this kind of 1972, 73 flap in Pennsylvania where UFOs and Bigfoot were seen at the same time. It was kind of a thing actually that was happening then. Um, So this case is the Emelson case in Poland. So what's, first off, what's the deal with farmers seeing Having so many wonderful encounters. I'm so jealous. Maybe I should become a farmer. Anyways, in May 10th, 1978, Jan Wolski was riding his, uh, he had a horse-drawn carriage, and he was riding along pretty day in the countryside in Poland, and these two beings that looked like the being on this slide appeared next to him. Then they kind of scurried off in front of him and went to like a little break in the bushes. So... Jan decided to kind of, he's like, wow, this is, that's not normal, probably. I'm going to go follow and see where these little creatures went. And so he goes and he sees this, like, kind of rectangular craft with these, like, four, like, screw nobules on all four corners and a little elevator that he sees the three, the two entities go up into. So he gets closer to it and he actually steps onto the elevator and goes inside, too. And one weird detail that I, (laughs) <laughs> that really sticks out to me is that this is obviously looks like a very techno highly technological craft, but the door was like made of some kind of like fabric carpet. Like it was like cheaply like tacked on the door. So anyways, he goes inside and then they're, they tell him to undress and they take these two kind of saucer like devices and kind of, you know, scan him, do some tests on him. And, you know, then he's told to put his clothes back on. He's offered some icicles, which he assumed was some sort of food. And I probably would have taken one. You never know. It could be delicious. Um, And then, you know, at the same time, uh, a young boy named Adam Popolek claimed to have seen UFOs while he was experiencing this thing. Later on, when they came to, you know, investigate, I think a couple days later or a day later, there really wasn't any evidence of the craft, but there was a lot of little weird footprints. Um, just a truly bizarre encounter. I love it. Oh, that this is um a monument. It's kind of a famous case in Poland. They really celebrate it, so they developed a little monument to it. It's beautiful that little that little box. Um, and so some of the you know another thing you know some of the after effects of these things. And I don't know if this has anything to do with it, but I think it's worth mentioning that the Wolski family, Jan's family, had a lot of different problems. People were fa- falling ill. One of his sons, Edward, actually died in mysterious circumstances when his body was found in a nearby forest. And today, the Wolski farm is completely abandoned. So not kind of a tragic ending to that one. All right. I'm sure some of you out there know about All Color Sam, Sam the Sandown Clown. Hello, and I am All Color Sam, which is maybe the best quote from an entity ever. So... In Lake Common, Sandown, Isle of Wight, UK, 1973, a young boy and a girl heard this, were playing outside, you know, having a great time. They heard this ambulance noise, really loud, and then the ambulance noise kind of stopped, and they looked in this little stream where there was a bridge right by, and they see this, you know, what looked like a man or a clown splashing around the water. And then the entity gets up and starts hopping, doing high knee jumps, like, away from them towards this like metallic looking structure uh you know they were very curious obviously and so they walked towards the structure walked towards sam and they said it looked like a cross between a clown a robot and an alien they the kids said it behaved shy but friendly 
And then all of a sudden it grabs a microphone. But it's it's kind of confusing whether it actually spoke in the microphone or it just kind of held up for effect. Um, he and Sam ended up taking the kids to the metal hut where he was, you know, in, interacting with them. They asked Sam if he was a ghost, and he said, not really, but sort of. Something to that effect. I can't remember the exact quote. They asked him if he was a man, and he said no. But then he kind of drew on a piece of paper, hello, my name is All Color Sam. Uh, <laughs> and so that's why they referred to him as Sam. But Sam claimed that he just got done building the shack, and it was made of metal, and it had these kind of like weird devices on the wall that they're not, the kids weren't sure if it was wallpaper or actual devices, but there were some sort of like technological aspects, almost like this was a craft itself. Um, and Sam claimed to live in the interior of the shack. And in one little detail that I find so weird and beautiful and wonderful, Sam does almost like a magic trick where he takes a berry, a blueberry, puts it in his ear, shakes his head around violently. The berry appears in his eye. Then he shakes his head again, and the berry <laughs> comes out of his mouth. And I believe it was uh, Rob Christopherson who said it's almost like he was doing a taste test to make sure if the berry was good or bad. And I, I love that. Um, uh, also, so, you know, yeah, he, uh, you know, one thing I, uh, the wonderful thinker in this stuff, AP Strange, mentioned to me that during this period in uh, the Isle of Wight in the UK, there was kind of this pagan revival and there was a music festival right around then that was kind of, you know, like celebrating. There was a whole like movement in like music. It was like pre heavy metal, but it was kind of pagan influenced a lot of, you know, Dungeons and Dragons imagery that happened. And, you know, as Sam's holding the microphone and it, it's almost like, you know, it, this resonant energy, maybe, <laughs> you know, like he, he, he can explain it much better. You should bug him about it. But it, I thought it was very interesting. He's kind of, um he's the one I think he's, he's really made Sam, I think kind of a known popular guy. All right. So that is, you know, essentially my, my, um, that's my lecture. And that's, uh, you know, it's, it's the weird stuff. And to me, these encounters kind of feel more like a performance in a little black box theater of an off, 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 off Broadway show. And maybe they're even a mask for what these anomalies really are almost as if they're pieced together by cultural images and taken into some sort of bubble of non-reality. I find it interesting to almost kind of like look at these displays or, you know, encounters, whatever you want to call them, like a little Steven Spielberg movie or more like a David Lynch movie, I should say, directing these little scenes from a remote location. So while we're all, or you're all, or whoever is waiting around, you know, trying to wait out this political drama of our government telling us exactly what you want to hear about UFOs and a kind of a package X-Files narrative structure. Don't forget about the weird parts because the stories are perhaps the point. And, and maybe they will lead us even to better questions because I don't think we'll ever be able to really know what this stuff is per se, but being able to ask better questions, I think is a big step forward. So thank you everyone for your time. I really appreciate this. I hope <laughs> some of it made sense. But um, I really do appreciate the time. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, in Namanon Conference. Woo! All right.